Flash drives may get all the love these days, but hard drives are bigger than ever, literally. New technology is coming that may enable 20, 30, even 60 terabyte drives, but they will need to handle some weird physics to deliver this massive storage. Welcome to Upscaled, our explainer show where we break down the technology that will help you back up all those Blu-rays you'll never watch again. For consumers, hard drives are becoming a thing of the past, with flash-based SSDs much faster and generally a little more reliable. But as more of our devices and services are storing our data in the cloud, data center drive requirements are exploding. Bigger and bigger drives are in high demand to handle our endless stream of data. And if companies can boost capacity by simply swapping larger drives into existing systems, it can save them a lot of money versus having to actually build out new server racks. Physical hard drive shipments may have peaked in 2010, but in terms of terabytes stored, more disk space is being shipped every year. Just to be sure you're following along, SSDs or solid state drives are the ones based on flash memory like the storage found in your smartphone and most laptops these days. Whereas hard disk drives or HDDs are the old school drives that actually have a motor and a physical spinning disk inside of them. While hard drives may be old school, the technology in them is still pretty amazing with newer drives packing as many as eight or nine platters into the drive, all of those spinning at over 7,000 RPM. Newer drives are even filled with helium to help reduce the air resistance on those platters as they spin. But with our current generation of 16 and 18 terabyte drives, we are approaching the limit of how many platters you can actually cram into a drive and how much data you can fit onto each of those platters. But a pair of new technologies, HAMR and MAMR, may offer a path forward to the future. First, remember the basics. Hard disks store data by magnetizing groups of tiny grains of metallic alloy that are coated onto a platter, which is the actual spinning disk. These tiny grains are grouped together into bits, which actually store the zeros and ones of the data, and these are arranged into concentric rings called tracks. Fun fact, hard drives aren't actually a spiral. It is just concentric rings, unlike a record or even a CD or DVD. The hard drive also has a read and write head at the end of an arm, which is controlled by an actuator that can move that arm back and forth across the disk as it spins. Data is actually read by sensing the pattern in the magnetic fields of those bits, essentially whether magnetic north is pointing up or down, and it can write data by applying a magnetic field to remagnetize and change the polarity of those bits. Hard drive capacity increases in two different ways. You can either fit more tracks onto the drive or fit more bits into each track. According to Carl J, a VP at Western Digital who we spoke with, the tracks are already only 50 nanometers wide and each bit is only about 10 nanometers of a track. At these minuscule sizes, making either of these dimensions smaller is going to start to run into some fundamental physics. Let's take a look. The first option is to shrink the width of those tracks to fit more rings onto each disc. This is a fine idea, but it means you will also need to make the right head smaller. After all, if the right head is wider than the tracks by too much, when you write data, you might accidentally change data in neighboring tracks. Sort of like trying to write with a marker that is wider than the lines on your sheet of paper. If you make the right head smaller, it becomes harder to generate a strong enough magnetic field to actually write data to the bits. This makes sense. The smaller wires have a hard time carrying as much current, and a smaller magnetic field is weaker than a bigger one. Now, you could compensate for this by tweaking the platter material to lower its coercivity, which is a measure of how resistant a material is to being demagnetized by an outside magnetic field. But here we run into another problem. Lower the coercivity too much and your disk gets unstable. Because of the awesomely named super paramagnetism, in magnetic nanoparticles, just like those on the surface of a hard drive platter, the lower the coercivity is, the more likely those nanoparticles are to randomly flip their magnetic polarity, especially as the temperature rises. So change your platter material to have a lower coercivity to work with a small right head, and you could end up with a hard drive that will randomly jumble your data on a hot summer day, or say in a warm server closet. So our other option was to make the magnetic zones, the bits themselves, smaller, but this also runs into the same bit flipping problem and for the same reasons. So how do you actually pack more data into a drive? The solution for now is energy assisted magnetic recording, which uses different energy sources to excite the magnetic layer on the platter and make it easier to write to. Microwave assisted magnetic recording seems to be considered the less crazy of the two options, though it's still a little nuts. 
This adds a spin torque oscillator to the right head, a tiny device that generates a microwave field in the 20 to 30 gigahertz frequency range. This field gives the material an extra nudge that lowers the coercivity just at the point of the right head making it easier to write data just to that one bit. As complex as this is, and I tried to fully understand the physics going on here, but spin torque transfer is just beyond me for the moment, this doesn't vastly change the structure of the right head. The spin torque oscillator itself is essentially a tiny device that's a sandwich of two magnetic layers with a non-magnetic layer in between them, kind of like a magnetic capacitor, and it uses just a few milliamps of DC current to generate the microwave field. Heat-assisted magnetic recording is a little more extreme. Now, this uses a tiny laser diode on the right head to actually flash heat the bit being written to several hundred degrees. This pushes the material past its Curie temperature. This is the temperature at which a magnetic material stops being magnetic. If a material being magnetic is partly a result of the atom's electron spin all being aligned and orderly, the Curie temperature is the point where the energy added to the system makes everything break down into a chaotic jumble. This also lowers the material's coercivity, and as the material cools, the magnetic field from the right head can kind of drag the nanoparticles into a new magnetic polarity. in just a few nanoseconds. So amazingly, it doesn't heat up the drive any more than normal operation does. At first, Western Digital was really developing MAMR while Seagate was focused on HAMR. And as of just a few years ago, there was some serious skepticism around HAMR. There were concerns about power usage and whether the laser could degrade the platter material and how reliable those laser diodes would actually be. But it's worth noting that at this point, Seagate, Toshiba, and Western Digital are all developing HAMR to some degree. MAMR, for its part, is expected to be good for drives up to at least 30 terabytes and maybe beyond, but HAMR could be good for up to 60 terabytes. And you won't have to wait too long to see this in action. Toshiba just announced the first consumer MAMR drives are shipping now, and Seagate has been sending out HAMR drives to industry partners. Now, these aren't giant leaps forward in capacity, they are 18 and 20 terabytes respectively, but they are proof of concept that this actually works, and you should start to see the gains pretty soon. Western Digital itself has a third method they've been using in their larger 18 terabyte drives that they are calling EPMR, or Energy Assisted Perpendicular Magnetic Recording. Now, some folks seem to be confusing this with MAMR, and to be fair, EAMR is a catch-all term for all of these methods, but what Western Digital is doing is a little bit different. When a hard drive writes a bit, it takes a second for the right head's magnetic field to scale up to full power, or saturation. This time to saturation is actually pretty inconsistent and can be different with every write. Western Digital calls this variation in time to saturation jitter, but they say that by passing an electric current through a different part of the right head, not the coil that generates the magnetic field, they're able to even this out and have a more consistent write performance. This might boost reliability, and when you know exactly how a write is going to perform every time, you can design everything a bit closer to the platter material's tolerances and maybe cram a bit more data onto the drive in the process. Now, the one big downside to all of these methods is that they are expensive and it may take a while for the price per terabyte of new hard drives to start going down. Now, these energy-assisted recording methods are only a few of the improvements we're expecting to see in hard drives in the next couple years. There's also multi-actuator designs that can read from two different locations in the drive at once and may be able to double speeds up to about 450 or 500 megabytes a second. And there are multi-actuator arms that could improve seek times and latency. Hard drives are never going to be quite as speedy as flash memory, but if you have a few dozen terabytes of data lying around that you need to back up, physical disks are going to be your best bet for a while longer. So what are you going to store in your brand new 60 terabyte hard drive? I will say one of these upscaled projects can easily run to about 250 gigabytes, and I am definitely in the market for some more storage space in my archive system. Let us know in the comments below, and we'll catch you next time.